Welcome to History Nachos. We do things a little differently. Names and dates take a backseat to humanity's greatest real stories. So sit back and enjoy the ride. In the 11th century, Christendom spanned from Western Europe to the deserts of the Middle East. There it faced off against Christianity's greatest rival, Islam. The Byzantine Empire, based in Constantinople, had served as Europe's frontline defender for centuries. But the Byzantines were overwhelmed by powerful warriors from the Eurasian steppe who sided with Islam. Extremely holy ground rapidly fell into enemy hands and pilgrimages became dangerous. Constantinople desperately called for help from its allies in Western Europe. Pope Urban II rallied the nations of Europe to put aside their differences and fight for their common heritage. The Pope gave Europe's warriors a mission to reclaim the Holy Land. As Europe's armies swarmed to the Middle East, a war on behalf of the cross began. The political, spiritual, and cultural consequences would transcend continents and centuries. The echoes of this campaign still resound in the Western world and the Middle East. In the year of our Lord 1096, men from all over Europe departed from their homeland to fight for what they held dearest. This is their story. Welcome to Episode 8, The First Crusade. All the great things are simple, and many can be expressed in a single word. Freedom, justice, honor, duty, mercy, hope. Winston Churchill Major conflicts often boil down to one-word concepts that contain much more depth, like the ones Churchill mentioned. Those kind of ideas are usually so foundational to a society that people consider them worth taking up arms and fighting to protect. In medieval Europe, the word holy held that kind of importance. Thanks to Ramon in Santa Barbara, California, for the topic request. Before launching into the First Crusade itself, I need to set the stage a bit. European civilization took a face punch when the Western Roman Empire collapsed in the 400s. While the Eastern Roman Empire kept chugging along pretty well, the West was a different story. Today, it would be like someone set off an EMP and all the electronics shorted out. Europe descended into post-apocalyptic chaos for several centuries. We call them the Dark Ages. Various Germanic tribes had struck deals with Rome to govern different parts of the empire. After the central authority collapsed, everyone looked at each other and decided to turn their individual governorships into independent countries. The same nations still stand today, with almost the same borders. We know them as France, England, Spain, Germany, and Italy. By the 11th century, Europe was well down the road to recovery, thanks to leaders like Charlemagne and Alfred the Great. Think of it like a UFC fighter one week after a big fight. Not bloody and bruised anymore, but still not back to 100%. Working back to the Roman Empire's level of civilization would still take several more centuries, but things were much better than the post-EMP Mad Max era of the Dark Ages. By this point, all the former Roman areas were also staunchly Christian. The church was all that remained of any central authority, so it became medieval Europe's version of the UN. So what about the Eastern Roman Empire? It stretched through modern Turkey, Greece, and the Middle East. Much of Roman civilization and authority had relocated to Constantinople, so over there, business continued as usual. The Eastern Empire still called themselves Romans, and still considered themselves Romans, but they became known as Byzantines. Byzantine comes from Constantinople's original name, Byzantium. During all the chaos in the former Western Empire, a new power had risen up. Islam. Muhammad and his successors conquered their way across North Africa and the Middle East, then smacked into the Byzantine Empire. The Byzantines stopped the advance, so they became the new front line for Christendom. 
the Muslims also began to come into Europe by crossing Gibraltar over in Spain. That whole drama will be the subject of our next episode. For now, all you need to know is that the Muslims almost took over Spain, but the Spanish pushed back. By the time of the First Crusade, the Spanish had the momentum and kept gradually retaking Spain. Europe got a serious scare from Islamic invasion. The Spanish were also not as involved in the Crusades since they were already fighting a holy war. That got the Spanish a hall pass. Going into the 11th century, the Spanish had their situation under control, the Byzantines enforced Christendom's boundaries, and everyone else continued recovering from the civilizational punch of Rome's collapse. So, naturally, history threw down a wild card. Mid-century, the Seljuk Turks came down from the Eurasian steppe and started conquering everything in the Middle East. For more on Eurasian steppe warriors, listen to the Sorgatani episode. Short version? The civilized countries of the Middle East could not beat these dudes who grew up rough in the wild. To add another wrinkle to the story, the Seljuk Turks practiced Islam. Baghdad functioned as the center of the Islamic world, so the Seljuks made a beeline for it. After taking over most of the Islamic world, the Seljuks started to move towards Egypt so they could collect the whole set. But on the way to Egypt, the Seljuks traveled along the border with the Byzantines, and they could not help but notice all the nice stuff right there for the taking. The temptation proved too much to resist, so the Seljuks decided to take on the Byzantines. In the 1070s, the Seljuks began to advance. The Byzantines put up a fight, but the Seljuks brought overwhelming force. Nothing out of the ordinary, just a more powerful country taking over a less powerful one. So why did anyone besides the Byzantines care? Well, the Byzantines guarded the Holy Land, which presented a problem for the rest of the Christian world. Israel, Syria, and western Turkey are the birthplace of Christianity and include its holiest sites. By the 1090s, the holiest places of the Christian world belonged to Islam. That became a serious problem because of pilgrimages. Remember, this all took place before live streaming, photography, or even realistic paintings. Only by taking pilgrimages could people see holy sites or even visualize the biggest events of the Bible. In a society highly based on religion, pilgrimages were a big deal. Christianity literally kept things together while Europe recovered from Rome's collapse. Jeopardizing pilgrimages posed a danger to the moral, cultural, and political fabric that held everything in society together. Imagine going to our recovering UFC fighter and ripping off a bunch of important bandages. The rulers started getting nervous because without the one unifying factor and the societal standards it brought, they faced the prospect of Dark Ages 2.0. The fighting between the Seljuks and the Byzantines made the pilgrimage routes incredibly dangerous. The government prioritized dealing with the invasion, so banditry thrived and added a whole other dimension of danger. Even if pilgrims made it to the Holy Land, they were in foreign territory controlled by Islam. In just about any time period, being a Christian foreigner in a Muslim country is risky business the ever-present danger that Muslims could destroy the sites also loomed. We are talking about medieval times, after all, and plenty of historical precedent existed for destroying an enemy's religious sites. In addition to all the practical points, there was also an ideological angle. Christianity was the moral bedrock of Europe, the only thing that stayed consistent in highly unstable times. An attack on Christianity was an attack on everything people in Europe held dear. Across history, there are ideas and principles people are willing to fight and die for. Christianity is one of the big ones. Soldiers still fight for it today. On top of losing the Holy Land, the Byzantines now faced an existential crisis. During the early 1190s, Seljuks started closing in on Constantinople itself. At that point, the Byzantine emperor realized he could not handle things on his own and reached out to the Pope. He wanted to build a coalition with the Western European nations. The emperor needed to go through the church, a.k.a. the medieval UN. 
Imagine when President Bush formed the military coalition after 9-11 to invade Iraq and Afghanistan, and you'll get the picture. The residing pope at the time was Urban II. He agreed with the Byzantine emperor and decided to rally Europe to bring military aid. In November 1095, at the Council of Claremont, the pope gave a huge speech where he summed up everything I've been talking about. The pope basically told all of Western Europe, It's time to fight for God. Mount up and meet in Constantinople. The response was overwhelming. Within months, armed men from all over Europe flooded towards Constantinople. By May 1097, Constantinople was full of professional soldiers and raw recruits. It looked like southern England right before D-Day. I can't help but think of Dwight Eisenhower's words to his troops going into the Normandy landings. You are about to embark upon the Great Crusade, toward which we have striven these many months. The eyes of the world are upon you. The hopes and prayers of liberty-loving people everywhere march with you. That pretty much sums up the attitude when the order went out to begin the advance. Target number one was Nicaea. It was an important city for several reasons. First of all, over land, Nicaea was just 85 miles from Constantinople. The Seljuks taking Nicaea acted as the last straw that made the Byzantine emperor call for help in the first place. Nicaea also served as a critical waypoint on the road to the Middle East. Now the Seljuks used it as their local capital and forward operating base. Nicaea held religious and political importance too, because it hosted the convention venue where the church resolved big religious matters in Christianity. The Crusader army turned out to be quite effective. After a short siege lasting barely over a month, the Seljuks surrendered. It was short for several reasons. The Seljuks primarily fought as horse archers, not a useful skill set for fixed fortifications. Sieges played to the Crusaders' strengths since they regularly dealt with castles in Europe. The Seljuks also relied on an adjacent lake to get resupplied. The Crusaders snuck warships onto the lake overnight and shut down the stream of provisions. Sieges turn on who can last longer, so not having access to food and water means checkmate. As the Crusaders began salivating at the chance to plunder a city, the Seljuks decided to work out a surrender deal with the Byzantine Emperor instead. The Byzantine Emperor spared the Seljuks. Not a popular decision. The emperor decided to take Nicaea intact, and compensated the crusaders by providing money and supplies from the Byzantine Empire. The troops grumbled, but accepted the decision, and the Byzantine emperor established that he called the shots for big picture stuff. After all, somebody needed to control this huge multinational force. Most importantly, the crusaders achieved victory, Nicaea got the ball rolling. Over the next year, the Crusaders swept southward across Turkey and into Syria. In October 1097, the Crusader army arrived outside the walls of Antioch, one of the five original patriarchal cities of Christianity. The Crusaders had just officially entered the Holy Land. Things just got real. However, at Antioch, the Crusader army hit its first big obstacle. Aside from the religious importance, Antioch acted as another geographically strategic point. Antioch had become an important city back in the time of Alexander the Great, over a thousand years before the First Crusade. In the meantime, Antioch had built legendary defenses. Ironically, it was the Byzantines who had built the walls before Antioch fell into Muslim hands. Harsh terrain also surrounded Antioch making full encirclement impossible. Antioch had its own water supply, and cities from all over the Muslim world sent provisions in anticipation of the coming battle. The geography also made several access points difficult for a besieging force to cover, so the defenders could come and go freely. This place was about as siege-proof as it gets. However, the Crusaders did have some advantages— they far outnumbered Antioch's defenders and could still get supplies. The Crusaders also came fresh off a string of victories and believed in backing by divine providence. 
when running offense in a siege, logistics and determination largely factor into the outcome. The Crusaders had plenty of both. As the Crusader army approached, the Seljuk governor in Antioch started to get nervous. Even with all its strategic advantages, Antioch still included a lot of Christians in its diverse population. Fearing the Christians would side with the Crusaders and sabotage the defense, the Seljuk governor cracked down. He expelled most of the Christians, but imprisoned Antioch's main Christian leader. The board was set for the climactic showdown between the Crusaders and the Seljuks. When the Crusader army arrived at Antioch, the standoff began. The Crusaders way outnumbered the Seljuk governor and his men. The Seljuk governor had limited resources and manpower, so he decided not to send troops outside the walls to disrupt the siege. He called for help and got word that headquarters sent reinforcements on their way to break the siege. The governor planned to hold the heavily fortified city until the Seljuk army could arrive. However, the governor's strategy contained one big flaw. It allowed the Crusaders to rest after their march and get set up without hassle. Upon seeing how big a challenge Antioch posed, the Crusaders also had time to ask for reinforcements and bigger siege engines from the Byzantines. The governor eventually realized his error and started sending out raids to mess with the Crusaders. The fighting became fierce, but the Crusaders fought off every Seljuk raid. While on a supply mission, a big contingent of the Crusader army bumped into the Seljuk relief army. The Crusaders pulled off a miraculous victory thanks to some quick tactical thinking. Not good for the Seljuk governor's plan to wait things out. The Seljuk high command stuck to the original plan and sent out another relief army. The second relief army took a fort near Antioch, which seriously worried the Crusaders. The Crusaders responded by attacking the fort. The Seljuk governor saw his chance and decided to attack with the Crusader army divided. The Crusaders defeated the relief army and sent it running, then came back to take on the governor's guys. The governor saw the writing on the wall and pulled back inside Antioch. Then the governor got good news and bad news. The good news? The Seljuk High Command had assembled a huge army from all over the Muslim world. It could destroy the Crusader army, and it had begun marching toward Antioch. The bad news? The Crusaders figured out how to shut down the city's access points. Timing became absolutely critical. The governor needed to hold out until the big army arrived and the Crusaders needed to take Antioch and use its defenses for themselves in order to avoid defeat. The commander of the big Muslim army goofed up because he tried to secure his flank by besieging a different city before going to Antioch. He tried for three weeks to no avail, then decided to head for Antioch. This blunder gave the Crusaders three extra weeks to prepare their main assault on Antioch. One of the Crusader leaders struck a deal with one of the commanders of Antioch's walls. However, due to the delicacy of the situation, he did not tell a lot of the average soldiers. A good amount of Crusaders thought they were facing annihilation from the big Muslim army and defected. The next day, the wall commander agreed to a deal. At night, the inside man opened the gates of Antioch's western walls and the Crusader army surged in. After an eight-month siege, the Crusaders finally took Antioch. Well, most of it. While the governor fled, his son took some troops to the citadel and dug in like ticks. The Crusaders isolated the Seljuk holdouts and carried on. The Crusaders killed all the Muslims still in the city. Pretty bad by modern standards, but back then, normal operating procedure included killing everybody in the whole city after a long siege broke. I know it sounds terrible, but in that time, leaving anybody alive meant exercising restraint. Anyway, the Crusaders now posted themselves inside Antioch and set up to fend off the huge relief army. The Crusaders adopted the same strategy as the Seljuk governor, wait for a bigger army to come. The Byzantine emperor had heard about the new developments at Antioch and started coming that direction with his own big army. 
On his way to Antioch, the emperor ran into refugees and defectors who told him not to bother with a lost cause. The emperor sized up the situation and decided to turn back home based on bad intel. The crusaders trapped inside Antioch now had to figure out a way to survive on their own. Word got back to the crusaders waiting for the emperor's help, and I think you can imagine the reaction. The crusader commanders decided to get even. The emperor had struck a deal with the crusader army. Byzantines would bankroll and supply the operation in exchange for the right to keep the reclaimed lands. The crusaders decided to keep the land for themselves. The deal was off. Screw the Byzantines. Now the crusaders fought not only for God, but for a whole new country of their own. Things got pretty dicey, but the crusaders actually managed to hold off the huge Muslim army. However, supplies started running out, and the Crusaders offered a surrender deal. The Seljuks rejected it. Turnabout is fair play, so things would get brutal when the Muslims eventually took the city. The Crusaders realized they needed a miracle. Oddly enough, the Crusaders got their miracle. They found the Holy Lance buried in one of Antioch's churches. For anyone unfamiliar with the Holy Lance... It is the spear used to pierce the side of Jesus Christ during the crucifixion. That makes it one of the most important relics in all Christianity. People believed that any Christian wielding the Holy Lance could not be defeated in battle. Whether you believe it too depends on your religious beliefs. But one thing is certain. Finding the Holy Lance completely flipped the Crusaders' morale. Bolstered by new confidence from finding the Holy Lance, the Crusaders made a full attack on the Muslim army. Then the craziest thing happened. The huge Muslim army scattered and ran. It turns out the Muslim army lacked... unity. Islam is full of divisions, and this army came from all different parts of the Islamic world. Unknown to the Crusaders, the Islamic commander struggled with internal conflict and mass defections. The Crusaders running a bonsai charge pushed everyone remaining past their limit. Against all odds, the Crusaders achieved victory. At this point, the Seljuks still hold up in Antioch Citadel surrendered because, well, game over. The battle ended, so now came the good part. Spoils. The Muslim army fled too quickly to pack up their stuff. The Crusaders found a welcome surprise of food, water, horses, and gold. The Crusaders had pushed the Seljuks out of the Holy Land. However, Jerusalem and modern Israel still remained in Muslim hands. While the Seljuks dealt with the Crusaders, the Egyptians took advantage and seized Palestine. Solid plan. One problem. Now the Egyptians held the holiest part of the Holy Land, and the Crusaders wanted it bad. The Crusader commanders decided not to go immediately into another big battle, though. The troops needed time to recover after the intense siege of Antioch. Thinking ahead, the Crusaders spared the staff of Egypt's embassy in Antioch and sent Crusader ambassadors to Egypt. Negotiations began to retake the Holy Land with a deal instead of a war. They lasted months. Eventually, Egypt made a final offer to allow unarmed Christians limited access to Palestine and Jerusalem. The Crusaders insisted on actually controlling Jerusalem, even if it meant splitting Palestine with Egypt. The sides could not agree, so no deal. Time to ramp up again. The Egyptians began amassing an army, and the Crusaders needed to take Jerusalem fast. The Crusaders immediately marched for Jerusalem. A siege started but the plan changed when time got short. The Crusaders instead stormed Jerusalem's walls and forced their way inside. What came next has consequences to this day. When the Crusaders got inside the walls, the whole city went completely nuts. It was like the fall of Berlin in World War II. Urban combat, street by street, and near anarchy. The Crusaders killed every Muslim they found, except a few taken for ransom. Unfortunately, they treated Jews the same way. The Crusaders perceived Jews as collaborators with the Muslims, so they got lumped into the same group. The lucky ones just got stabbed. The rest died in ways considered excessively brutal, even by medieval standards. 
Holy sites, mosques, and synagogues were not exempt. Even hardened veteran crusaders became horrified with the situation. Several commanders tried to tone things down, but the rampage instinct had already kicked in. Just for clarity, the rampage instinct while taking a city is a general human characteristic, not just a European thing. Identical accounts of the same kind of behavior come from many cultures across the ages, including the Islamic world. In all the chaos, the Egyptian garrison retreated to the citadel. They saw the rampage coming and decided to quickly cut a deal. The Egyptians surrendered in exchange for safe passage. As for the non-Christian civilians who survived, some crusaders forced them to bury the dead, then killed the survivors. Up until that point, taking Jerusalem qualified as harsh, but still barely within the norm. The more psychologically screwed up aspect of the second round of killing outraged the Islamic world for over a century. Whenever you hear about Muslims still angry about the Crusades, the sacking of Jerusalem in 1099 is one of the main things on the list. For those of you thinking, okay, but that was a long time ago, there are two main reasons the Crusades are still an issue of contention in the Islamic world. First, Islam does not emphasize forgiveness between people as much as Judaism and Christianity. Grudges remain for generations at both personal and societal levels. Contrast that to the Jews. Remember, the Jews got the same treatment, but forgiveness is huge in Judaism. Now Judaism and Christianity are firm allies. Second, 900 years is not a long time in Middle Eastern history. Those cultures date back to the beginning of human civilization. In Middle Eastern terms, the Crusades happened relatively recently. Radical Islamic terrorists promote their cause by playing up past wrongs, which only reinforces the problem. Anyway, back to 1099. The Crusaders had taken the main objective of the whole war, but they still needed to address something. Remember the army the Egyptians started gathering? Now it was ready to go. The Crusaders left Jerusalem and marched for Egypt's staging point, Ascalon. Today, it lies just two miles north of the Gaza Strip. Outnumbered again, the Crusaders faced down the Egyptians. However, battle-hardened veterans made up most of the Crusader army, while the Egyptians lacked the same experience level. The Crusaders also came straight from battling the Seljuks, a more formidable opponent. Egypt got soundly defeated at Ascalon which confirmed Palestine and Jerusalem belonged to the Crusaders. Mission accomplished. Thus ended the First Crusade. The Crusaders had done it. After the Pope's call to arms, Europe united and retook the Holy Land. It was a defining moment, not just for the generation, but for the entire age. The Crusaders put aside national differences fought for what they all held dear, and achieved victory. Christian hands now controlled the holy sites, and pilgrimages became much safer. The European presence in the Holy Land largely shaped the following centuries. The men who made it through the First Crusade, or died on its battlefields, are now considered medieval Europe's equivalent of the greatest generation. After the crusade ended, many of the victorious soldiers returned to their homes and received a hero's welcome. Defectors bore the very public shame of cowardice the rest of their lives. The commanders created a series of new countries, now known as the Crusader States. Ultimately, several areas would become nominally part of the Byzantine Empire for political reasons, but they functioned independently. Christendom had taken the Holy Land. Holding on to it constituted another matter entirely. The religious diversity of the area presented major issues, and things got dicey in wartime. But whenever there wasn't a war going on, the Crusaders actually adjusted and lived peacefully with the local Jews and Muslims. Christian and Islamic powers fighting for control of the Holy Land largely defined the next four centuries. Today, the West and Islam still maintain high levels of involvement in the area, 
making it a major conflict zone. The former territory of the Crusader states is now known as Israel, Lebanon, Turkey, and Syria. For those of you that want more details about the Crusades, I highly recommend God's War by Christopher Tyerman. One of the world's top medieval historians went back to the primary sources and did a huge investigation into what really happened during the Crusades. It covers every crusade from beginning to end in high detail and covers over 400 years. Or, of course, you can look it all up online. As always, we would love to hear your feedback. Please comment, like, and share, or leave a review on iTunes so we can reach more people. You can also email us directly at historynachos at gmail.com, all lowercase. We have pages on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Patreon, and PayPal. For technological reasons, my older episodes are coming off of iTunes and SoundCloud, but will still be freely available on YouTube. Please consider making a donation to support making more episodes. Any amount is greatly appreciated. The links are in the description. Until next time, thanks for listening.